Hi, I'm Glenn. And I'm Mark. And welcome to another episode of Masonic Unity, The Right Stuff, our interview series on foundations of Masonic leadership. Uh, we are here in the Museum of Masonic Culture at 100 Barrick Street, uh, the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, and we are joined by a very special guest today, most worshipful and illustrious, Douglas Paul Castro. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you here with us, Doug. Um, we, we wanted with this, um, these interviews for, the, for our, our readers and our, and our viewers to see our Masonic leaders in a more casual setting where they can understand who you are beyond the social media, beyond anything that, uh, that uh, is going on, and just to, to get a good understanding of you. You got it. But also to give the, the membership and the craft out there an idea that you once were where they are now. Yeah. And, you know, what made you become a success? What made, you know, what led to your path to becoming Worshipful Master, Grand Master, and all your other titles? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So we want to start out back when you started. So can you tell us a little bit about what got you involved in Freemason? Sure. When I was a young child, I uh, remember my dad going out to meetings, and my mother would always say, Dad's going to lodge tonight, or he was going to the American Legion meetings. But I never really understood or knew what that meant. But I know Dad would go to lodge, and I know I wouldn't see him because he'd come back after I uh, went to bed in the evening, so I never got a chance to find out what it was about. Then I remember um, the Saturday before Christmas in 1973, my grandfather had just passed away a few days prior to that, and we were sitting at the uh, funeral home, and a bunch of men came in with aprons. I had no idea what they were doing or what mm -hmm. it was all about. And my dad got up with his apron on, and uh, somebody did like a eulogy, but I didn't know what it was about. So after I questioned my dad, I said, what was that all about? And he goes, oh, there were men from Lodge, you know, paying respects to your grandfather. Mm -hmm. So he goes, we do that for all, you know, Master Masons who pass away. But it intrigued me, and I still wasn't really sure what it was all about. I just knew about Lodge. I didn't know that it was Freemasons or Masons. I just knew that they were going to Lodge. So fast forward a couple years later, uh, at Christmas, I asked my dad, can I become a Master Mason? I was interested in you know, getting a little bit of history about it. I'd like to become a Mason. My dad ran over to his desk and pulled out <laughs> his, his petition, yeah. pulled out uh, his membership list of all the guys that, that belonged to the Lodge. And I'm looking through the list, and I knew Quite a few people there, yeah. friends, friends of my father, socially, professionally, um, police officers. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, police officers was our scout master and Boy Scouts. I'm looking through this list and I said, oh, wow, I know, I, I know these people. So I said, I think I made the right decision. So uh, that started off and I knew I was, I think it was my senior year when I was in pharmacy school. My father kind of directed me when I could take my degrees around my studies and when I had to take my boards. So I remember meeting with my father. He worked in Trent at the time. I was living in Spring Lake at the time. And um, I'm sorry, I wasn't living in Spring Lake. <laughs> I was at, we're in school in Philadelphia at Temple University. Mm -hmm. And when we would meet halfway at right. a restaurant, we'd go through the catechism, what have you, nice. uh, in the parking lot. And then I'd go to dinner with my dad, and then he'd go home, I'd go back to, to, to school. So uh, that's how I got involved in masonry back in 1978. That's wonderful. What lodge was that? Ocean Lodge 89 in Spring Lake. Spring, Spring Lake, that's where that comes from. Right, that's okay, why I said good. Spring Lake yeah. because good, yeah. it's, it's your home. Yeah. So that would make you a third generation? I was third generation, that's correct. But I think it was even further back than that because um, I found through my, my mother um, certificates from her grandfather, I believe, when he was in the shrine back in the late 1800s. Nice. So wow. actually, I think it goes back further than that, but I, I haven't traced it. But right. theoretically, I'm the third generation. Yeah. Okay. I think your, your experience with your father echoes most Masons whose, whose father was, were Masons before them. Yeah. I know for me, my father had a, had a petition in, the, uh, in yep. the drawer for me for many years. So I, I think that's a pretty common, common thing. It's a wonderful thing. It was interesting, too, because one of my dad's friends who they always said, called him Brother Lee. And he always called my mm. father Brother Frank, but I just thought that was just the relationship that they had. Yeah. I didn't really know what it meant. And then I saw his name on the membership list, and I'm yeah. thinking, well, I'm not really sure yet because I hadn't joined, so <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure about the yeah. Brotherhood stuff. And then it was interesting because when I got my EA degree, 
I saw him one afternoon. He goes, "Hey, brother E. A. Doug, how you doing?" I said, <laughs> "Brother Lee." It clicked. Yeah, <laughs> that it was a yeah. Masonic term yeah. that I didn't yeah. understand up until that point in time. Mm. Yeah, and I know your sons went through as well. Yeah, I was a grandmaster. Um, you know, my boys went in, and then it was 21 years of age. You had mm -hmm. to be the joint. And I remember I was getting ready to go to um, the Florida trip mm -hmm. with the uh, Masonic Charity Foundation to uh, see our brother down in, in Florida. And I remember uh, before I left, I put two petitions on the kitchen table. And I said to my boys, if you want to join, sign the petition and I'll know when I get back. Mm -hmm. If you don't sign it, then I know you don't want to join. Mm -hmm. So the whole week I'm saying, oh, you know, are they going to join? Are they not, not going to join? Yeah. Yeah. So when I got home, they, they both signed their signatures That's on the wonderful. petition and then we went from there. Yeah. And it was interesting because uh, I had to do it while they were uh, in college. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't do the uh, degree. And I wanted to do it while I was still grandmaster. Yeah. So we actually did it in July. And we had a uh, merchant communication in the Grand Lodge. And since I have twin boys, Steve and Chris, yeah. we we did the degree simultaneously because I couldn't figure out who I wanted to raise first and who I wanted to raise right. second. Yeah. So my dad came up from Florida and we raised them simultaneously. I remember nice. that. I was yeah. at the degree. Wait. It was a wonderful experience. Yeah. 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 I don't know if I'll ever see that again, but it was it was uh, yeah. yeah. That's that the memories are wonderful. Yeah. That's that's great. So going back to your experiences, what what's the most memorable experience you had? going through your Masonic experience, and then while well, you were Grand Master. I think I know the answer to the second one, but uh, what about the going Go, through your... Going through the officer yeah, line, becoming yeah, a worshipful master. I remember sitting in lunch with my dad, and um, the 12 craft degree, and the guy who was giving a lecture, I looked at my dad and said, I think I can do that lecture. Mm -hmm. Dad said, seriously? And I said, yeah, I really believe I can do it. So he goes, then we gotta get you in the Masonic line, in, in the lodge. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, so I went through the chairs, and I knew that we were having problems with, with getting officers. So I knew when I became worship master in 1985 that I would be doing it again back to back years in 86 as well. Mm -hmm. And I do remember that um, we never had a business meeting the entire two years I was there. We always had a program, always yep. had a program. And uh, this one was really interesting. Uh, I had been at some Masonic function and uh, they had belly dancer. And I said, wow, I'm going to have a belly dancer at one of my meetings. Okay. But then the Eastern Star, who, who met in our building, and I knew a lot of women, <laughs> you know, they had heard wind of this. And I said, oh, don't worry, I'm going to invite you to this. So uh, after the lodge was over with, uh, I asked the belly dancer to come in, and I had the Eastern Star ladies there. Mm -hmm. And then this girl was teaching them how to do belly dancing. And it was hysterical. It was great. They loved it. And yeah. all of a sudden, you know, all the women were talking, oh, you know, we got to do this. Doug did this in lodge. And it was, mm -hmm. it was successful. It worked out really well. That was always a great memory going through the church there. That's great. Yeah. And how about when you were Grandmaster? I guess there's a couple of them. Uh, one of the biggest ones was my dad was able to um, uh, speak from the floor to nominate me for Junior Grand Warden, which was obviously one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, raising my sons while I was Grandmaster was obviously another one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the end of my term, uh, my annual meeting, my dad received me in the East. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So, what have you been doing since the Grandmaster? Are you busy? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, not only being Grandmaster, but uh, with the York Rite and with Scottish Rite, both. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in the York Rite, you know, I served at the um, High Priest and Grand High Priest, both of the, on the uh, state level with Royal Arch. Grand Master of the Grand Council and, and uh, Right Emory Grand Commander of the Grand Commandery. So I've been involved in the York Rite. Scottish Rite, I go back to around 1993, I think I'd just become a District Deputy Grand Master. And uh, the 17th District always had a member of the 17th District in the Lodge profession. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Egan, who was mm -hmm. my secretary, mm -hmm. uh, was in the uh, Lodge profession line. And there was an opening at the bottom of the line, and Charlie said, uh, Doug, we need you to get in here because I'm going to be out in two or three years, so we right. need to keep the, the trend going. So I said, all right. So I got into the Lodge Perfection and uh, finished that. And those were in the years where there was no unity classes. Right. Each valley did their own mm -hmm. degrees all the right. way through. Right. And uh, when you sat in the chair, you learned the part, and you did your own part. And there was no degree teams or anything like that. So I remember sitting through there, going through that seven year line, learning every part and setting <laughs> mm -hmm. for yeah. two reunions back to back. <laughs> <You do. laughs> I remember um, 
another fellow named Bill Bailey was there, our commander in chief, and he asked me if I would be interested in getting into the consistorial line. And I said no, because in those days you had to be a 33rd to get into that line. Mm -hmm. right? And I was only a 32nd. So I said no. I said maybe someday if I become a 33rd, I will, but not right now. I don't want anybody to force me right. into a position yeah. where you know I have to make them make me become a 33rd. Right. I want to earn it, and right. then I'll get in the line. But I said, I'll tell you what, Bill, I'll be happy to sit in the line if you don't install me, mm -hmm. and I'm not a member of the line. I'll just help you out and do the, the part in the degree, mm -hmm. which I did. And then come uh, August, I got the phone call from Thurman Pace telling me that I had just been elected to uh, receive my 33rd. Yeah. So I got in touch with Bill and I said, Bill, uh, you know, I'm interested now to be installed on the <laughs> And he started laughing. It was almost like, yeah, he already knew he it. Knew, I, was yeah, getting, yeah, you know, yeah, I didn't yeah, know it, but yeah. he, you know, he knew it. So uh, that's how I got through the consistorial line. And then um, I finished that and then I took it off a couple of years through Scottish Rate because they went through the elected grand line. Mm -hmm. right. And then when I got done with that, I came back and went through the Princes of Jerusalem line. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, not too long after that, um, Veron Skipper was starting to go down, his health was declining. Mm -hmm. So he said to me, I, I'd like you to take over the uh, learning centers for me to become mm -hmm. the chairman of the learning centers. And I said, fine, I said, I'd be glad to. So I um, met with him a couple of times. He uh, was definitely at the time, but start, was trying to step down. Mm -hmm. definitely, yeah. He just wanted to direct all his time toward that. Yeah. And uh, so I met with Dave Blatley, because he had become deputy at that point in time. And he asked me if I was going to seriously take over the position. I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, so I'll make you a, a deputy rep for the learning centers only. Mm -hmm. And then uh, not too long after that, Dave became sovereign grand commander. And uh, Danny Wilson then became the uh, uh, deputy for New Jersey. Mm -hmm. and that was creating a, a position as a, an active member of Supreme Council. And uh, David said to me, because I'd like to submit your name as an active for Supreme Council, would you be interested? And I said, certainly would be. So uh, I was elected to become a, an active member. And then um, Scottish Rite started the uh, Path Forward program. Mm -hmm. And Danny Wilson had been asked to head that up with a, uh, another past grand master from Indiana named Gail Kemp. Mm -hmm. So the two of them focused a lot of the, their time on that. And Danny said, I can't do both. I can't be part of the program and help direct it at the same time I become deputy. So Danny stepped down as, as, as uh, deputy for New Jersey. Uh, and that created that position for me. Mm. And then um, Tom Sturgeon, who was a past Grand Master of Pennsylvania, a very good friend of mine, uh, was Grand Secretary General. And he was aging out at 75, mm -hmm. and he wasn't able to hold that position any longer. And he had recommended me to replace him as Grand Secretary General, and, and David accepted that. And then I was elected by to my peers to be Grand, Grand Secretary General. Mm. So I guess that brings up the date. <laughs> it doesn't complete the interview. <laughs> That's so. All of us going through the chairs, we usually have some mentor, okay. someone mm -hmm. who guides us, whispers that friendly yeah. counsel into our ear, and we kind of work on developing um, positive habits and leadership traits. Did you have someone mentoring you? And if so, what did you learn as an, as an officer, as a, a member, you know, as a leader of one of these Masonic bodies that you think that our, our viewers may get from just some words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. well, I guess my first Masonic uh, mentor would obviously be my dad. Um, my dad never was an officer in Lodge, but he knew all the ritual. And he would be our academy instructor for our Lodge plus another mm -hmm. one or two Lodges. So um, he would mentor me through the Masonic scenarios in the Lodge, okay. the ritual part of it and what have you. But there's a fellow named John Outlaw. Oh, yeah. You remember John? Yeah. John was probably the best ritualist I've ever met in my life, and a gentleman through and through. Yeah. And uh, very, very well respected. And our lodge used to meet on the first and third Friday nights. And John lived in Asbury Park, and my lodge at that time met in Will Township, which was only maybe three miles, four miles away. So when I was master, John would come over to my lodge on Friday nights and said, John, you could be any place in the state. Why didn't you come into my lodge? Yeah, right. He goes, well, there's not a whole lot in those days that were Masonic League events on Friday mm -hmm. nights. So he goes, uh, plus I want to be you know, close to home and you know, it's just ideal for me. So John would come over to lodge early with me and we would set lodge up. He'd be explaining the, you know, mm -hmm. everything, the reason why things were set up the way they are and they would go into history lessons. And, and I learned an awful lot from him and uh, learning how to uh, to uh, uh, 
relax, um, have a conversation with people, make them feel that they're important mm -hmm. and they're special. Mm -hmm. And John was just a really good teacher. So I guess through his patience and perseverance with me, I try to emulate him at times. So right. Yeah. John yeah. Allen was probably yeah, that, that's, that person that's for pretty me. Impressive. Yeah. yeah. But that's a nice foundation to have. Not yeah. only father on the ritual side, yeah. but to have John kind of explain, yeah. well, this is here, but this person does this, right. and kind of explains all the different parts. Right. Right. That, that yeah. friendly counsel in someone's ear that we're supposed to be giving and doing. Yeah, and that was John. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I said, you're, so, you're an important individual. <laughs> he was very well respected and mm -hmm. safe. You know, why are you coming here, you know, emotional all yeah. the time? And he goes, you know, I guess he saw maybe some potential in me. Some I don't know. But yeah. We had struck up a, a, a very, very great relationship. That's great. Yeah. Wonderful experiences. Now, you, you spoke a few moments ago about being um, an active for Scottish Rite and the deputy and the secretary mm -hmm. general. Um, I think most of our viewers probably know what an active does in the Scottish Rite, and maybe even a deputy, but what do you do as the Secretary General for Scottish Rite? Can you give us a little bit of explanation about that? Well, as Grand Secretary General, um, I oversee uh, the uh, agenda and all the minutes that takes place during our annual meetings or any emergency communication within uh, Supreme Council. Uh, any programs or anything that's going on that needs my documentation, uh, either I document it or I have somebody in the office do it for me and then I verify mm -hmm. it. Uh, proofread it uh, and uh, test mine into it. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the really nice things about it is I get to sign all the 33rd patents. Nice. For all, yeah. the, all the people that become 33rds, I get to sign their patents as yeah. Grand Secretary General, along yeah. with the Sovereign Grand Commander. So that's, that's yeah. something nice. But uh, basically, uh, I archive a lot of the minutes and make sure that everything's documented and uh, uh, stored at, at Supreme Council. Mm -hmm. So, are you uh, in that position? Are you able to do much traveling for Scottish Rite? I have traveled a little bit, um, not a lot. Uh, obviously, I travel around uh, the northeastern area within mm -hmm. the 15 states, but I had the opportunity to travel to Andorra. Really? Which is a very small country between yeah. France and Spain. Uh, interesting. I was able to go there with uh, our Grand Chancellor, who is, was, uh, who is still is Thomas Sturgeon, and uh, we went over there for the consecration of the Supreme Council. And uh, so we sat through their, their um, consecration and uh, met a lot of uh, foreign dignitaries mm -hmm. that I still communicate with today. The, one of the biggest countries I still communicate with is Greece. Interesting. And then I just got a letter, believe it or not, within the past month, and thank you for asking, from uh, Endor, uh, making me an honorary member of their Supreme Council. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. That's thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, then uh, we tend to come to Grand Masters on behalf mm -hmm. of the Supreme Council. Um, and that's really the extent of my travels to date. Okay. But you're also doing committees and all um, that other behind the scenes stuff to make the Scottish Rite flow the way it does. Yeah, we have what we call committee week and we normally meet four times a year. And we just finished last week, uh, the January one, mm -hmm. which is always by Zoom because of the weather conditions up in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. But then uh, three other times throughout the year we have actual committee meet. And, uh, and those meetings can go up to you know, two, three hours apiece. Mm -hmm. Investment financing, uh, uh, administrative council, uh, those are two of the ones that I'm on. Um, and the, uh, I'm also in the Library and Museum, okay. which is a separate corporation mm -hmm. under the Supreme Council headquarters. Right. Right. So uh, I'm on their boards as well. Interesting. So it's an interesting concept, keeping things going up and up there. And yeah. We have during the committees, we have recommendations to staff to do programs, and a lot of times they'll do the programs, come back to us mm -hmm. for verification and for uh, being able to uh, give them the authority to move forward with a lot of the programs. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm very partial to your uh, library museum up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a it's a wonderful place. So. Yeah, I'm on their board of yes. trustees. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, what do you feel like you've gotten out of Freemasonry? <laughs> a lot, especially friendships. I think that's probably the most important thing I think I've gotten out of it. Mm -hmm. People that I, like you two, people that I would have never have met mm -hmm. if it wasn't through Freemasonry. Yeah. Um, the idea to be able to, like we're doing now, talk in front yeah. of people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess leadership skills and qualities, mm -hmm. um, being able to arbitrate, you know. Mm -hmm. just, dispute going on to help you know benevolently try to resolve issues mm -hmm. things that I probably would have never had the opportunity to do if I hadn't been involved in Freemasonry right but I guess the probably the biggest thing is uh, is friendships that's wonderful 
which is great for us to hear because yeah. with everyone talking about the titles oh, yeah. there, um, everything else in front of their names, yeah. the initials in front, the initials behind, yeah. that it really comes down to friendships. It is, yeah. Forget about the titles, forget about the aprons. Yeah. You know, when you walk in the lodge, that's a different scenario, but outside, it's, it's, it's a Doug Mark blend. Yeah. Yes, yeah. You know. And I think that's really important to, to communicate to everyone, old and young, that that's what it comes down to is just relationships. Yep. That's, that's what it it teaches is. us. And networking, you know, what have you, uh, people can help each other out. Like again, scenarios that you would normally have the uh, opportunity to do if you weren't involved in an organization. Now it seems like it seems like you've done quite a bit in your Masonic career. Is there anything that you still would like to do? Is there anything that's still ahead of you? Um, no, I think I think I reached the max. <laughs> Being a five star general, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and one of the few five star generals, yeah. Grand Master, Grand High Priest, Most Illustrious Grand Master, Right Eminent Grand Commander, and. Um, Scottish Rite active yeah. and deputy. Um, Grand Prior? <laughs> or we're working on that one? I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, my interest is you know, just being involved in Freemason. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm not looking for any more titles. Good. <laughs> I'm not looking for any more jobs. Uh, I'm spread pretty thin as it is. So but I just want to key on what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Besides the friendships, I think what's important is that you've gone through all these things. And yet you're still active. Mm -hmm. You're still hanging around the lodge. Mm -hmm. You're still giving back to Grand Lodge and all these other bodies that you're a part of. Yeah. Where a lot of people have that flight, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I've got my 33rd, I'll what see you later. Yeah. 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 Um, but you're staying involved, which is something we would encourage everybody out there. You know, wh whether you've been worshipful master, grand master, whatever, is yeah. continue to give back to the lodge because that gives the lodge a future. And that mentoring part, and part of that leadership that yeah. you, that you uh, teach and give. Well, I think I've gotten more out of Freemason than I've ever given to it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And where do you see the fraternity going in the future? I think we're going to have a downward trend. I think in membership. I know you know we're doing everything we can to reverse the trend, but I do think um, that if we don't give the youth what they're looking for in the organization, we're going to have a tough time reversing the trend. But I do think um, that we might be downsizing a little bit more, but I might consider that right-sizing. Mm -hmm. Because I think what will happen is, is we'll have the individuals in there that are there for the right reasons, that really want to get right involved people. in, right, mm -hmm. want to get involved in the community, get involved in whatever projects that you know might come along the lines, whether it's mm -hmm. being involved with our youth programs, whether it be Demon Lake Rainbow, whether it be involved in Boy Scouts, Little mm -hmm. League, you know, I think we're going to get more community-minded people that hopefully that mm -hmm. will, will get to the organization. Uh, so, you know, people talk about quantity versus quality. Um, you know, you sure you need the quantity to keep your, your buildings going, what have you, mm -hmm. but I think we need the, the quality, and I think that's I think that's our our trend yeah. and our focus going forward. I hope. Okay. Okay. Now you also talk about the youth. And that's, we all know that the youth are really what's going to drive us in the future. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what can we do to improve our youth experience or getting them involved into the craft? Oh, good question. <laughs> uh, when I was Grand Master, one of my projects was Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. I haven't been an Eagle Scout, or still am an Eagle mm -hmm. Scout. Yep. Um, I was an Eagle always. always an Eagle. Eagle. Yeah. That's the only thing I have on my adult <laughs> resume as an Eagle Scout. <laughs> um, Bob Sheridan was Grand Master, and he allowed me to start my program as getting involved with the Scouts as when I was Deputy Grand Master, so that I was off and running when I became a Grand Master. And uh, we got involved with um, uh, Jersey Shore Council, which I'm on their executive board mm -hmm. today. And the big thing was then is these kids all want um, immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. So my comment to the um, executive officers of, of the Boy Scouts was, I don't mind giving you money to help with projects, but I want Masons there helping mm -hmm. the Scouts, whatever the project may yep. be, whether it be cleaning up their their uh, waterfront scenarios or mm -hmm. whether you know tents or getting involved in, in uh, merit badges or getting mm -hmm. involved with their. Um, uh, some of their um, festivals and campsites and that kind of stuff. 
I want us involved with that mm -hmm. because I want them to see what Freemasons do. Mm -hmm. And hopefully down the road, maybe at that time you had to be 21, but now it's 18. For them, they'd be one considering joining us because we help them out in their youth. And that's kind of the way I see that with, with uh, the boys. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, the Rainbow, I think the biggest thing is, is with that is, is uh, hopefully with parents who have you know ladies mm -hmm. to get them involved uh, with the activities that are going on within the Rainbow system. Mm -hmm. And then we, well, as you were going back to the Boy Scouts, it was not just the financial contribution. I write you a check for fifty bucks. Here you go, yeah. but it's writing that check and going, I'm giving up a Saturday yep. yeah. to help you out at this campground right. because I care. I wanted them to see us right. involved. Emotion. And that's exactly what I said. We're not just going to write you a check, but we have to be there involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember what we did is we had, uh, uh, they had an uh, Order of the Arrow uh, building that needed to be uh, rewired. Mm -hmm. So we helped them rewire that building. Uh, the campsites, uh, they needed uh, uh, platform tents. So we helped them, you know, install some mm -hmm. of those tents right, right. and those type things. Uh, so I wanted them to see us and our involvement. Yeah. I didn't want to just, like you said, write a check right, and, yeah. and walk away. Yeah. You know, anybody can do that. Yeah. But I wanted us to be involved in it. And believe it or not, when I sent out the, the uh, plea to a bunch of the mm -hmm. guys, a lot of Boy Scouts that are Master Masons showed up and yeah. helped out, yeah. uh, which was phenomenal. So uh, matter of fact, we even have a plaque on the Order of the Arrow building in uh, Jersey Shore Council that nice. says dedicated by the New Jersey Freemasons. Nice, nice. Yeah. Very, Very nice. nice. Very nice. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned about youth, I know a lot of us went to thinking, you know, young people, teenagers about joining. I kind of smiled inside because I'm sitting there thinking, you know, Masonic youth also includes that 35 year old who has just gotten married, his mm -hmm. kids have grown a little bit, joining the fraternity. Mm -hmm. It's the 65 year old guy who is retired and wants something to do, yeah. wants to give back to the community. So that's also part of the outreach yeah, that we do with right that. Yeah. And speaking of the outreach, the Almoners Fund. I would be remiss as your rep not to mention about the Almoners Fund and how people can donate to that. The Almoners Fund is a, is a phenomenal uh, uh, scenario that we have with our membership. And uh, if anybody's down on their luck, uh, financially, could it be uh, somebody just had a major surgery or uh, couldn't meet their medical bills or would. Um, Hurricane Sandy, when it came mm -hmm. along, people's homes were devastated, what have you. Uh, Scottish Rite, Grand Elmer's Fund was there to, to help provide, I think it was like a million three hundred thousand dollars for the state of New Jersey. Alone. And that came about because of networking, which yeah. you've spoken about. Yeah. Also talked about relationships mm -hmm. and, and friendship yeah. that yeah. just brought that all together to get back to the community. And what's the nice thing about the Elmer's Fund is that uh, there's no paperwork involved. You don't have to fill out a form, yeah. you don't have to do this, you don't yeah. have to do that. Usually it's a phone call that comes in to me from you know yeah. from you fellas or, or anybody in, in, uh, in uh, Grand Lodge uh, saying somebody's down on their luck, you know, I'm going to ask a question or two and then I'll shoot off an email to a Supreme mm -hmm. uh, Council and usually within uh, 24 to 48 hours if they deem it, you know, yeah. uh, proper, they'll send a check out right after that individual or to me to make that presentation or me to give it to somebody else to make the presentation on Supreme Council's behalf. Yeah. Yeah. And now our Grand Lodge has done the same thing. Right. So they've imitated that. Yeah. So uh, we have a Grand Almer's Fund in New Jersey. And a lot of times, if somebody needs money desperately, um, and it's a, a, a pretty heavy sum of money, we'll mm -hmm. split between the Grand Lodge Almer's Fund and the yeah. Supreme Council Almer's Fund. We'll yeah. do 50 50. So right. they get their money, but it doesn't hurt either one organization, you know, and then yeah. talk about too much too quick. Right. Yeah, there's so many stories about how these Almer's Funds have just changed people's lives oh, yeah. Yeah. and just brought them back from the brink. True. And That's Scottish Strait has some great videos on that, mm -hmm. saying basically every I call it, it's the you were there video that mm -hmm. uh, Walt Wheeler did. That yeah. Just, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Earlier you mentioned about the CDC. A lot of our viewers are, are barely familiar with masonry, yeah. let alone some those initials CDC. Would you mind spending a couple minutes on? Sure. It's the Children's Dyslexia Centers. What we do is we have um, a relationship with Hurley Dickinson University. And they teach the Orton Gillingham method of uh, reading. Uh, a child might uh, become dyslexic and have difficulty in reading and um, uh, maybe fall back in their studies in school. Uh, so, what happens is if that's identified, uh, they will notify any of us for all intents and purposes and, and we'll get them into the program. 
We don't do the teaching. Fairly Dickinson University um, gets the students, they get the teachers who get a, a certification at the end of two years um, through uh, us and through uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University, giving them the, the, the accreditation uh, for being able to become a uh, young man teacher. What will happen is we as Freemasons, we're uh, responsible basically for the building that they meet in and the financial backing for the program. Mm -hmm. And we have five centers in New Jersey and our annual budget is just, just a little bit below $600,000 a year. So it's, uh, we have uh, five chairmen, five boards, one for each center, and their sole responsibility is, is generating income, fundraising, whatever it may be, to generate the money enough to, to support their budget for their, their, mm -hmm. uh, their center. Uh, we currently have approximately uh, 200 children in the program at any given time. Uh, we have the teachers that are uh, in the program that get the certification that they're looking for for the Gordon Reform of Young Ham. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a win-win. They're getting a certification that they want, which takes yeah. two years, and each child usually it's a two-year term to get them through the system. Right. When the kids come out, uh, I think probably 100% of them actually read at a higher grade than what they are currently in, in school. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's an extremely successful program. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Now, uh, we've talked about CDC, we've talked about the Grand Almoners. How do people get involved, either donating or uh, becoming members of Scottish Rite, or, or just being involved in, in, in your work here? Uh, Scottish Rite has a, a, a number of um, uh, programs that they offer, uh, you know, for fundraising, mm -hmm. charitable work, what have you. Um, we find out that Masons, more so than not, will donate to the Grand Almoners Fund. Mm -hmm. The Grand Almoners Fund basically, you know, benefits Freemasons. Yeah. The CDC scholarships we have and, and income that we're raising uh, for that program, a lot of that money comes from non-Masons. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of, you know, when a child gets into the program, they don't have to be related to a Mason. Right. It can be any child in, in the school system mm -hmm. And they might hear about the program and obviously they'll inquire and you know hopefully they get accepted into the program so that doesn't benefit freemasonry that benefits our community at large right, right so a lot of the donations we get for the cdc come in from outside sources but that's through tricky trays breakfasts dinners yeah you know, uh, raffles a yeah. whole bunch of different things right. golf outings right yep everything you mentioned yep yeah now um another thing that that strikes me that the that the Scottish Rite has really excelled in is PR for Freemasonry in general. Getting people in the door, getting them exposed to it. Can you talk a little bit about, about that program? That's a program that I had talked about earlier with Dan Wilson with the Path Forward and BA Freemason.org. Mm -hmm. um, it was a program that was designed and set up where they did um, uh, a survey of individuals around the country you know, about Freemasonry. Did they know anything about it? Mm -hmm. uh, would they be interested in joining and what have you? Yeah. And uh, if it piqued their uh, interest, there's a website that they could go to, and question it, and we would get their, their information and give them feedback. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that uh, these individuals would be um, interested enough to maybe uh, join the Masonic Lodge. So as the inquiries would come in, um, at that time they would go uh, to the Grand Secretary of, of, of each of the jurisdictions and then uh, they would usually give it to a district deputy grand master or maybe to an individual uh, in a district who was kind of overseeing that mm -hmm. and that they would follow up with those individuals mm -hmm. and then see whether or not they want to petition. So through Scottish Rite, um, the path forward, uh, we, we would benefit the individual grand lodges and the individual lodges with the hope that someday that if they did join the Freemasonry that they'd want to become a Scottish Rite mm -hmm. member. So we would help the Grand Lodges with no anticipation of us getting the benefit from right. it, but yet indirectly we were hoping that we would. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. how the, the, the program was, was basically designed. Yeah, I've, I've been to the website several times and it is a, is a wealth of knowledge, so yeah. I have to really commend you. Yeah. Just about Freemasonry in general, about uh, just a lot of good resources that yeah. people can learn from. So yeah. I, I really recommend it very highly. What's the, what's the website again? Yeah, Freemason.org. Be at freemason.org. So any of our viewers out there who are not Masons, 
go ahead and check out that website. It's, it's, it's really a good foundational uh, bit of knowledge. And that's sponsored by the Scottish Rite Northern Masonic Jurisdiction, that's the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction, and the Shriners. Right. Probably one of the, the Shriners being one of the most open uh, picture of what Freemasonry is about and their donations yeah. back to the community. Right. It's interesting that people don't really realize that uh, Shriners are, are all Freemasons. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, when that's attached to Scottish Rite and to the Blue Lodges, mm -hmm. it means a big deal. Yeah. Because people they recognize them, they have their, uh, their Shrine football classics and what have right. you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all their advertising that they're doing on television. Unfortunately, they, they're not allowed right. legally to say that they're Freemasons. And right. Unfortunately, I wish they were able to. <laughs> but the bottom line is when the three organizations came together a few years ago at Compton Grand Masters, like you said, uh, the Shrine, uh, Northern Masonic Jurisdiction, the Southern Jurisdiction, they came together as a unified shrine and to promote the idea that uh, it, it all belongs, it all starts with Freemasonry. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The Scottish Rite, the uh, York Rite, the Shrine, uh, nobody can survive without being a Freemason mm -hmm. first. Right. So yeah. by us being able to help Freemasonry yeah. and Blue Lodge, you know, like I said, over a period of time, hopefully we would reap that benefit. Right. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Well, we want to thank you for being with us today. Is there anything else you want to uh, say to our viewers uh, before we finish up? Yeah, we'd like to say one or two things. I want to thank both of you, Glenn <laughs> and Mark, for what you do for me and for Scottish Rite and, and Grand Lodge. Uh, whenever we have a reunion, you two spearhead it. Mm -hmm. You guys organize it. Uh, you guys are out on the floor, mm -hmm. back and forth, with explaining the degree that they had just gone through, getting uh, their involvement and participation. Uh, you're making me look good. <laughs> so without you two guys, <laughs> but uh, and plus, you know, during uh, uh, this interview, and I know you've done many in the past, but without you guys putting us in, in front of the our membership, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. Well, thank you. So thank both of you in it. So your sons are fourth generation Masons. They are. But still speak after the master, <laughs> master has spoken. <laughs> there is a whole other generation potential beyond that, right? You have grandchildren? I do. I have a grandson who's uh, five and a granddaughter who's five and three. Wow. Okay. So yeah, there's a potential there could be a fifth generation coming Good up thing. someday. Congratulations. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, thanks all for joining us. Mark, you want to take us out? Sure. If you're interested, and you really should be, please subscribe down below so you can see all of our many videos and wait to hear about that conspiracy video that we're working on. <laughs> Thanks, and take care. See you all later. Bye-bye. <laughs>